So far in this mini-series, we've talked a lot about different techniques that you can take to achieve a diversified portfolio. And we've also considered the advantages of doing that. But up until this point, we haven't considered how you should balance the risk across that portfolio to make the process as effective as possible. So let's put that right and make a start. Now the topic of today's episode is actually very much related to what we were talking about last time, which is the extent to which you can practically enable diversification across your portfolio. And of course, hand in hand with that, we have to determine a plan for how we will balance the risk across that portfolio. So as we've already seen in previous episodes, we can achieve diversification using a variety of techniques. So for example, diversifying across asset classes, also uncorrelated assets within an asset class, using different timeframes, and also implementing different trading strategies within the same account. And of course, the more of this you do, the more complexity there'll be. So we have to think of a way of carefully balancing the risk across each of these techniques. But the benefit of this is that if you get it right, then you stand the best chance of diversification working effectively to achieve its ultimate objective, which of course is to reduce the overall portfolio risk. Now, there are several options for this, some much better than others. So the most simplistic is simply to use a fixed position size for each trade that's opened as part of the portfolio. But this has a major disadvantage that we'll discuss in a moment. The second option is to have an equivalent position size. And this also takes account of scaling against the equity level of the account. But equally, this comes with a warning. And again, we'll cover this in a moment. Another technique that you might want to consider is ensuring that each trade has an equivalent risk. And then a much more advanced technique is one where you perform an optimization of the risk to reward ratio based on things like the relative correlation between each diversification technique the alpha of each portfolio component and the volatility of each underlying asset. So let's now take a look at the pros and cons of each of these techniques. So this first option would entail you determining what the ideal position size was to ensure that your portfolio remained within your personal risk tolerance level. So in previous episodes, we've looked at this concept of a high watermark that your equity curve makes. And based on that, the calculation of the risk tolerance below that, which effectively is the maximum drawdown that you're willing to accept. And so although this technique gives you some rudimentary level of risk management, it also has a number of disadvantages which is why it comes with this warning. But in terms of the pros, the obvious one is that it's fairly easy to implement, both programmatically if you're an algo trader, but also in order to inform the size of your trades manually if you're a discretionary trader. And of course, as we've already mentioned, it also attempts to keep the portfolio within your risk tolerance, but the effectiveness of that is very much in question. Now, in terms of the cons or the disadvantages, this pays no attention to the differing volatility of each of the underlying assets that form your portfolio. And of course, assets with higher volatility will pose a higher risk. But this model doesn't take account of that in any way. What it also doesn't do is take account of where your stop losses are set. And because of that, you could have some trades that have a huge impact on your equity when your stop loss gets hit and other trades 
that have a much smaller impact when the stop loss is much closer to the entry price. And so you've got that wide variance of risk that's not being managed. Furthermore, it doesn't, of course, scale risk with your equity because you're just using a fixed position size. Now, what this means is that when you have a smaller equity, you're at much higher risk of experiencing a significant drawdown than when you are when your equity is higher. So overall, this is not a recommended approach. Let's take a look at the second option. And this is using a similar technique, but this time the position size does scale depending on how much equity you have in your account at the time that each trade is opened. Now, just like before, you'd have to determine, probably through some combination of analysis and backtesting, that this was in line with your personal risk tolerance and that wasn't likely to be exceeded. So again, in terms of the advantages, it's still relatively easy to implement. Slightly more complex, but not much. And this time we see the additional advantage that this does scale risk with the equity in your account in order to attempt to maintain an equal likelihood of a set drawdown at any point in your equity curve. But this still has similar disadvantages to the previous option. It takes no account of volatility of the underlying assets. It takes no account of the risk associated to the stop loss values that you're setting and therefore you'll be experiencing a different risk level in every trade you take. So once again, use this technique at your peril. This is not a recommended approach. Now the third option is where you aim to have an equivalent risk per trade. So one technique to do this is to First of all, calculate where your stop loss needs to be, and that should be based on the logic behind your trading strategy. Then you perform a calculation to determine what position size would deliver a specific percentage loss of the account's equity if that stop loss were to be hit. And this technique has a major advantage over the other two in that now, Every single trade has an equivalent worst case impact on the account. Now you will need to decide what that is, of course. So you might consider values of 0.5% of your account's equity per trade or 1%, or you might prefer to remain more conservative and go lower than this. And these are the tough decisions that you need to make for yourself based on your own risk tolerance. Also, because this is always based on a percentage of your equity, this of course means that your risk scales as your account equity changes. If your account equity goes down, it would start to reduce the position size that you were putting on each trade. If the equity goes up, it would start to increase it in a linear way in relation to that equity curve. Now, this technique does also, however, have its own disadvantages. So first of all, the calculation takes no account of the relative correlation between each of the assets or the timeframes or strategies that you're trading as part of your portfolio diversification. And what that means, of course, is that there may well be two assets that you're trading that are fairly correlated. And if you're simply putting the same level of risk on both of those trades at the same time, that of course will add up if both of those trades turn against you. And if they are relatively correlated, the chances of that happening is fairly high. Another disadvantage is that this technique takes no account of the potential alpha from each of those assets or strategies. So one of the components of your portfolio might produce high alpha and another component only a low level of alpha. But this technique does not take that into consideration in any way and it would still attribute the same level of risk to each of them. And so that brings us on to the fourth option that I'm going to consider, which is a portfolio that's been optimised for risk and reward. 
Now this is a much more complex technique and is actually beyond the remit of this introductory mini series that I'm doing. So I'm only going to cover it very briefly, but I will cover it in a lot more detail in a number of episodes in the future. But when done properly, this technique does consider what the relative correlation is between each and every component in the portfolio. And based on that, it would adjust the risk in order to optimize the strategy. Equally, it would consider the alpha of each of the components, and so could actually attribute a weighted risk depending on what the anticipated alpha was from that trade. And that, of course, would be based on the backtest performance that you'd undertaken for each of the individual components. Additionally, we've mentioned before about volatility, and all assets have different levels of volatility, which of course produces different levels of risk. And so by combining all of these factors can lead to a truly optimized portfolio strategy. Now, as I said, the concepts here are fairly advanced and the techniques very complex. And so it is beyond the realms of this mini series, but in future episodes, I will endeavor to take the covers off this and look at the techniques that you can use in order to take advantage of this type of institutional risk management. Now, recently we've been looking at the Darwin X platform and looking at some of the features that relate to the topic that we've been discussing. And this time's no different. And I thought it would be a good idea now to look at some of the risk related attributes of the system that give traders valuable insights into the way that they're actually managing risk in their accounts. Now, up until this point, I've always looked at the Darwins of other traders, but I thought today, when we're looking at risk, we'd take a look at one of my own Darwins. And if you want to search for a particular Darwin on the system, you can use this search bar here and just type in the code for the Darwin. So the best way to get an idea of the risk metrics is to go to the Investable Attributes tab. And there are two specific attributes that are of particular interest. The first of those is risk stability. Now what this is assessing is the behavior of traders in terms of the consistency of the risk they're placing on the account. So ideally, what we're looking for is a nice flat line like the one that you see here with a minimal amount of variation. And what this means is that there is a fairly predictable level of risk being placed on the account over time. And each investable attribute is allocated a score and that usually goes up to a value of 10. And so here you can see that the score I've achieved for this is 9.02. Now, if you do see a chart here where the risk level is going up and down significantly, that means that that particular trader is making decisions that are changing the risk level on a regular basis. Now, there's another investable attribute, which is the risk adjustment. And this gives an indication of the leverage that was used on each of the trades over different durations of trade. So each one of these dots represents an individual trade. And so what we're looking for here is a close cluster of all of these points to show that they have a level of consistency. Now, one of the unique features of the Darwin X platform is that risk is dynamically adjusted before a system is made available to investors. So even if a trader does make a decision to place a lot more risk on one particular trade, which obviously would then pass on to investors normally, the Darwin X platform makes adjustments before that happens. And you can tell when that has happened because you'll see outliers in this chart, which will actually be in a different color. 
to show that Darwin X has intervened to make that risk adjustment. In this particular case, that hasn't been necessary for the trades that I've undertaken, but you will see that on certain charts. And that's all about protecting investors from irrational risk-based decisions. Okay, so we're now approaching the end of this mini-series. But in the next episodes, I'm going to be looking at how to measure correlation. And of course, this is a critically important thing to do when you're considering how to diversify your portfolio. And you're going to need to have some indication of how correlated the assets are that you're trading, how correlated maybe adjacent timeframes are, and how correlated each of your trading strategies are to each other. And based on this information, you can then make logical decisions about how to enact that portfolio diversification. But of course, you can only do that if you first know how to measure it. Now, if that episode's already available, you'll see it top right now. Please do remember to give me a thumbs up. And now until next time, trade safe.